and uh, turning off our videos, just the two of you. Thank you. Have a good talk. <laughs>
the TWAS uh, uh, Fellowship, uh, and uh, um, he's member of the three academies of, uh, uh, of India and has been president of uh, the Indian National Science Academy uh, uh, from 2014 to 2016. Uh, and uh, uh, so now, um, uh, one of the things that I've been very interested in ever since meeting him is, is looking at the way he looks at science as, as a whole. And uh, if you haven't already, please go and check out this very interesting blog and, and uh, associated podcast that he started on The Wire in both English and Kannada versions called More Fun Than Fun, The Wire Science. Um, and uh, um, so it is my great pleasure to, to welcome Professor Gadakkar to today's uh, Foundation Day talk. I leave the stage to him and I'll stop sharing and I'll see if he can share his slides and move forward. I'm also very happy to see that um, today we have a lot of Ayuka members on Zoom with us, as well as some of the members of our governing board and council. Uh, I'm very happy uh, that you took your time to, to attend. Thank you very much for attending. And there are a lot more people on YouTube um, uh, and uh, who are also witnessing this. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, uh, so much for the invitation and for the kind words. It's a great honor for me to give the Foundation Day lecture of Ayuka. This is one of the great institutions of this country, which uh, we admire, we cherish, and I have had the pleasure and honor of being of witnessing the, this institute's growth, in fact, since its birth. And I have had the great pleasure of visiting, uh, really visiting several times and speaking uh, to, uh, to large live audiences in the, of this institute. I visited uh, when uh, Professor Narlikar was the director, when Naresh was the director, when Ajit Kembabi was the director. So I know all of these people and I admire all of them. And I think the country really should be grateful to for all of these people to set uh, an example of the kind of institution and i think this country needs many more such institutions uh, as, a, as all of you know ayuka not only does outstanding research but they really network the whole country including people scientists from uh, universities and colleges amateurs so this is the spirit of science that uh, this institution, I think, is the leader in, in spreading in this country. So I'm particularly pleased to be able to give the Foundation Day lecture. Happy birthday, Ayuka, and uh, wish you many, many, many more uh, years, uh, centuries of uh, success in making science an activity of everybody else. It's not somebody sitting in an ivory tower doing something, but it's a way of life for everybody. And I think Ayuka has been in the forefront of making this philosophy real in this country. So I'm particularly pleased. I'm uh, delighted that I will have the opportunity today to talk to you about some work that I and my students have been doing over the many years. And in order to do so, I will uh, share my screen. It works. Do you have the main slide or you have? Uh, we have the main slide, the war and peace. Wonderful. Okay. So you, as you will see, I have called this talk War and Peace, Conflict and Cooperation in Indian Sex Society. Just a few minutes ago when we were chatting, uh, Somakre Chaudhary asked me whether I will foray outside the insects and talk about human beings. And I was telling him that it is not possible not to do so in, in many different ways. So. Yes, I am going to talk about war and peace, but I'm going to try and give you a glimpse of how war and peace works in a society very different in, uh, from our own. But let me begin with an introduction to what are insect societies. So I really, uh, can you see my second slide, which says what are insect societies? Yes, yes, works. Wonderful. As many of you would know, Many species of insects organize themselves into groups, which we might legitimately call societies. They are societies which resemble human societies in many different ways. They have cooperation, they have conflict, war and peace. They have communication, they have uh, division of labor, 
they have uh, democracy, they have uh, autocracy, they have punishment, they have rewards, they learn, they adapt, and they work in groups. So there really are societies like ours. But what is interesting is that in many ways, they are superior to us in, in, in many ways. They are better human societies in many ways. Now, the best known examples of such societies are not amongst the higher animals, but in fact, amongst the insects. The most famous example, of course, that is the, of the honeybee colony. Honeybees, as all of you would know, live in large populous colonies consisting of tens of thousands of individuals which work together as a society. But within the group, if you look closely, there are three kinds of bees. Every colony has one single large fertile female bee, which we call the queen bee. And a small number of male bees, which we call drones, uh, the number of male bees depends on the season, depends on the condition of the colony, and there may be a few hundred of them. But the rest of the colony, which consists of many tens of thousands of individuals, uh, would be smaller sterile female bees, which we call worker bees. The, these three kinds of bees together constitute this society. Actually, I should say only two kinds of bees constitute society because the males are famously lazy. So the word lazy drone has come from the lazy males. The males do not participate in any domestic work in the colony. They are born on these colonies, they stay there for a few days till they mature, and then they leave the parent colonies in search of virgin queens from other colonies to mate. And when they mate, they actually die. Indeed, they die in the act of copulation. So when they die, when they mate, they actually die, so they don't have any life after that, so they don't participate in any domestic work. These virgin queens, which actually mate with a large number of males and gather sperm from all of these males, and store them and nurture these sperm in their body to use them for their entire lifetime. Because the queen will never <coughs> make the risky journey once again in her life to mate. She will return to the colony and with workers who are her daughters, they will manage the rest of the society. Now, what you see in this picture is a close-up of a queen, which is in the middle here. So the queen, as you can see, is significantly larger than the workers. Now, just a few glimpses into how this society works. If you manage to see a queen, you will find that usually she's surrounded by a small number, 10, 12, 15 workers who are always very closely associated with her physically. In fact, they are, to use an anthropomorphic term, they are on royal duty. They are taking care of the queen, they are licking her, they are cleaning her, they are protecting her, they are feeding her. She apparently has no time to do any of these things for herself because she's extremely busy. And she's busy with eating food and converting that food into eggs. So she, the main thing the queen does is to lay eggs. And she can literally lay thousands of eggs per day. So she's constantly moving around the nest, looking for a place to lay eggs. And as she's moving, this retinue of workers who are on royal duty move around with her and take care of her. Now, if you watch this for some time, you will find that the workers, after a few minutes, apparently seem to lose interest in this job, and they go off and do something else. And other workers who are previously engaged in other kinds of tasks come and replace them. Now, this kind of working in shifts, shifts which last a few minutes, has very interesting consequences for the colony. Because the only other thing that the queen does, in addition to laying eggs, is she produces a number of different chemicals and releases them outside our body. We call these pheromones. And these pheromones actually regulate the functioning of the society. Now, by many workers coming in contact with the queen, because of this shift system, the queen's pheromones are accessed by a very large fraction of the colony. And that is why this seems to happen. Workers typically work at home for the first half of their life. Their lifespan is four to six weeks. Half of that they work at home, cleaning the nest, building the nest, processing food, storing food, feeding the larvae, guarding the nest and so on. The second half of their life, they venture outside and work for the colony, but outside the colony. And outside the colony, their job is to look for flowers. 
because they gather nectar and pollen grains from the flowers, which is their food. They get their carbohydrate from nectar and their protein from uh, pollen. So they gather these, bring it back to the nest and deliver it there for storage, for processing and for future use. The uh, nectar is also used by the adults. The pollen grain uh, and nectar are mixed together and fed to the larvae. In fact, uh, what is spectacular about uh, honeybees is that when uh, a bee has found a large source of food, she's able to come back home and perform a kind of dance. And through this dance, she's able to communicate to the bees at home what she has found, where, how far away, and in fact, how to get there. And once the bees at home watch this dance, independent of the dancer, now they can go and actually find that particular tree and access that particular flower, which may be several kilometers, maybe even 10 kilometers away from the nest. So honeybee societies are, are very, very interesting and they have uh, accomplished many things. What you see here, of course, is what makes honeybees even more interesting for an evolutionary biologist like me. Honeybees workers do half the time, as I said, they work at home, the other half outside, and they die without reproducing. Now, in a sense, this is an act of altruism because they spend their whole lives working for the welfare of the colony to take care of the queen's brood, but never have any children of their own. So this is what we call altruism from an evolutionary sense. But the altruism of the worker bee is even more spectacular. I don't know how many of you have been stung by a bee. It is a little bit painful for you, but for the bee, it's an act of suicide. Every sting for the bee is the last thing she will do in her life because when she inserts a sting into your body or into the body of any other animal, she's unable to withdraw that sting. The sting has barbs pointing outwards because of which when she tries to withdraw her sting, her abdomen ruptures and she leaves behind the sting and a poison gland which is still attached to the sting and even parts of her digestive system to fly away and die within a few minutes. But the poison gland, which is now sticking on your body, will continue to pump venom into your body. It is filled with venom. It continues to pump the venom. And people have measured this with the help of volunteers who allowed themselves to be stung for the experiment, that the poison gland will continue to pump venom into your body for some 60 seconds after the bee has flown away and died. This, of course, is death for the bee, but it makes for an extremely efficient venom delivery mechanism at the cost of the life of the bee. And that is why this is an extreme act of altruism. And as evolutionary biologists, we are interested in understanding how evolution by natural selection, which we normally think of as survival of the fittest, how does that promote such sacrificial altruistic behavior? That's one of the reasons why evolutionary biologists are extremely interested in insect society. What you see on the next slide is a drawing of different members of the colony of an ant. Ants are also highly social creatures and ants have gone one step beyond the honeybees in that when different groups of honeybees do different jobs in the nest, they're all the same bees, they all look the same. They just transition from one job to the other as they grow older. In the case of uh, the ants, different subgroups of ants within the same colony that specialize in different tasks are also different in their body. Their shape, their size is all different. And these are what we call them as subcasts. So they are morphologically specialized individuals, ideally suited to some tasks. So if you look at this smallest member of the colony, for example, she is ideally made to be able to carry small seeds back to the colony. Whereas this largest member of the colony is quite hopeless at that task. But this largest member is a very good soldier. He, she is able to pr protect the smaller workers who are carrying seeds back to the colony. So you have this kind of a specialization, which makes it very interesting that within a colony, within a species, even within the same sex, you have huge variation. The world record for such variation seems to be in this ant from Malaysia. What you see here on the right side of my slide, can you see the uh, insect now on the right side of my slide? Can, can you see it? Yes, yes, it comes. Because I'm 
Uh, unfortunately, in Zoom, I don't get any, any feedback. I want to be sure that you are able to see this. So what you see here is a scanning electron micrograph picture of the largest member of the colony on whose head my friend has placed the smallest member of the colony and taken a picture. In fact, it turns out that the largest member of the colony, which is a female, weighs 500 times the smallest member of the colony, which is also a female. So this is a kind of world record for variation within a species within the same sex. And I am very fond of telling people who study developmental biology and molecular biology that these two ants arise from the same genome. So the genome is exactly the same, but it is the environment that makes this huge difference between two different kinds of ants. And this kind of developmental biology is also now benefiting greatly from studying insects such as ants and honeybees. That brings me to the third kind of social insect or insect societies. There are more, there are termites and there are some beetles and there are some thrips. I won't talk about them today, but the third main group is that of the wasps, which are my favorites. Uh, like in many cases, many wasps are not social, but uh, many species are social. All social wasps are called paper wasps. And the reason why they're called paper wasps is they make their nest from paper. They don't make it from uh, soil as termites do, or from wax as bees do, or from leaves as ants might do, but in fact from paper. Now you might wonder where they get their paper from. They manufacture paper. You might wonder how they manufacture paper. They manufacture paper by a process which is remarkably similar to how we manufacture paper. They scrape cellulose fiber from plants, add various chemicals to it, chew it into a fine pulp, spread it into a thin layer and dry it and it's paper. In fact, you can write on it, it is paper. So what you see in this photograph is a, one of these large wasps where the entire nest is covered with a paper envelope, leaving only a small opening here for the wasp to fly in and out. Now, if you are brave enough to open this, then what you will see is what I like to call a multi-story apartment complex. You have several layers of paper made foam and so you might think of this as the ground floor, first floor, second floor, third, sorry, uh, third floor, four, five, six. So there are many layers. And in all of these, the wasps rear their young ones. In the case of honeybees, they have similar hexagonal cells as this, but the honeybees put these hexagonal cells for two uses. They rear their young ones and they store their food. In the case of wasps, they only rear their young ones. They cannot store food because all wasps are non-vegetarian. They're all carnivorous. They eat insect and other kinds of meat. And unfortunately, they have not invented refrigeration. So they have to get their food every day and the nest is used only for rearing the young wasps. Now wasps are particularly interesting but because many wasp species are somewhere in between a solitary creature and a highly social creature. They're somewhere in between and that gives us unique opportunities to understand how during the course of evolution, a solitary insect might have evolved into a social insect. And that's one of the special interests for wasps. Now this wasp, because it's very large and very dangerous and very difficult to study, I study a different wasp, which is not only easy to study, but also I would argue very beautiful. It's a one particularly beautiful wasp. It also makes nests from paper, but the nests are small. The number of wasps are few and the nests are open. They do not cover with an envelope. It allows us to see everything. And the nests are essentially two dimensional. So you can actually observe everything. What you see on this picture is the number of adult wasps. And you see some pupae, you see some larvae, you see some eggs in some cases, and everything can be observed without any great difficulty. And these wasps are even more uh, primitive in terms of their social organization. And that gives us many opportunities to study them. And I and my students have been studying these wasps for a very, very long time. In fact, for, for decades, and we can never get tired of studying them. There is always so much. To, we feel that we have barely understood these wasps and there are much, much more to be understood. <clears throat> I want to try and <clears throat> explain to you also why we do these things, how we do them and how we actually study them. So I'll begin by asking the question, can we really hope to understand an insect society? I mean, we are humans, very, very different species.
trying to understand a very, very different society. I want to emphasize that we do not begin with the affirmation that of course we can understand. Who knows? So we begin with the question, can we really understand? And I don't know the answer. I think we can, but I'm not sure. We try our best. Now, we take this question very seriously because as you know, people have, philosophers have often wondered whether we can actually understand nature at all. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus said, nature loves to hide. So it's not so obvious that we can understand. So this statement by Heraclitus, we keep at the back of our mind, and this is what gives us caution in our research. So caution is an important pillar of our research. However, a few centuries later, we can find another philosopher, the English philosopher Sir Francis Bacon, who said, nature does not unveil its secrets except under the torture of experiments. So Francis Bacon says, yes, nature loves to hide, but there are ways of understanding nature. And Francis Bacon gives us hope. So between the pillar of caution given to us by Heraclitus and hope given to us by Francis Bacon, we try to navigate our way with the hope that we can understand at least some aspects of, of the society. People often ask me, how do you, why do you study them in the first place? What is your motivation for studying them? Now, it turns out that insect societies are studied by a very large number of people for very different motivations, for very different reasons. Insect societies can tell us many things, can teach us many things, can also give us many things. Insect societies are studied by different kinds of people for different kinds of reasons. And some of this research is actually very practical. People have also made lots of money by studying insect society. For example, by studying how ants communicate, there is a whole branch of computer science in which people have developed new algorithms for use in computer science, in internet, even in, uh, in uh, cargo traffic of airlines. In fact, there's a whole subfield called ant colony optimization. There are other people who study insect societies because there, there are interesting pharmal, pharmacological things to study from them. There are yet others who study to understand how they organize themselves. Now, I study insect societies mostly for a somewhat different reason. And that's the reason I want to emphasize today. So why do you study social wasps? People often ask me. My answer is for the same reason that an anthropologist studies humans. Why does an anthropologist study human societies? Anthropologists can offer us a glimpse into the lives and mores of so-called primitive or exotic human societies. That's why they study them. That is their motivation. I believe that biologists can do much better. They can offer us insights from a whole range of animal societies with millions of years of evolutionary history, much more, much richer and much greater history. And those of us who study insect societies can hope to harness wisdom from an altogether different sub-kingdom of life. And the operative word here is wisdom. And that's really what I think we should be focusing on. People also ask me, but how do you study them? It seems somewhat mysterious to people how we can actually study these. It turns out that actually it is not very difficult to study. The biggest advance made in studying these is to be able to recognize individual wasps in a colony. See, all the wasps look alike. All the bees in a colony look alike. But if you can identify them, if you find a way of identifying them as individuals, then your observations become, become much richer. And that it turns out is actually quite easy to do. So we have a simple way by which we color code all the wasps in our colony. What you see here is a picture with every wasp marked with at least two spots of colored paint of different colors in different parts of the body. And by doing so, we can have a nomenclature of thousands of wasps with their own unique identities, their own unique names, and their own unique files in our computer, where we can keep track of what they are doing and who they are interacting with and so on. So this is something which makes observations really possible. If you watch a wasp colony without marking them, you see a little bit, but once you mark them, a whole new world opens up. 
because now you follow a particular individual and you begin to see that individual wasps are really different from each other they have their own unique personalities and they do things very differently from each other and then these interactions become extremely interesting now these wasps fortunately the species we work with like to live around human habitation so they are everywhere they are in our gardens in our bathrooms in our bedrooms in our windows in abandoned rooms everywhere and we can usually study them wherever they occur but for certain kinds of experiments we can also bring them to the lab and we can keep them in various kinds of cages we can keep them in cages of the kind shown here but we can also put them in little plastic boxes of the kind shown here where we can stack hundreds of such boxes and do large scale experiments and we can stack these cages and boxes into our large lab this is our lab which is called the vespiary this lab is unusual in that it has no walls all the sides are covered with wire mesh screen and we have adjusted the size of the wire mesh screen such that the wasps can easily fly in and out so they are free to leave if they want we don't always keep them closed but the bigger wasp i showed you earlier the one which makes the multi story apartment complex that wasp is a predator of this wasp that wasp eats this wasp and the size of the wire mesh is so adjusted that we keep that wasp outside and allow these wasps to go in and out so in many cases we even though we put them inside the cage which makes it convenient for us to observe them but we keep the doors of the cages open so that they are free to go in and out other wasps are free to come inside and so on but for certain kinds of experiments we might actually need to close the cage to do some kind of controlled experiment now relatively speaking this works very well and yet these cages sometimes for some experiment are not big enough and so we have more recently constructed these very large walk in cages and these walk in cages are wonderful because both the wasp and the student who is studying can sit inside the cage and actually make observations so this is fairly large space so you can actually see the dynamics of their social behavior much better in these large walk in cages now i want to step back for a moment and uh, say how we do these things now our main interest of course is the interaction between conflict and cooperation because that's why i call this war and peace one of the problems in communicating science is that we are always obsessed in telling our audience what we have found we are very fond of selling the products of science but we do not convey with equal interest the process by which we made these products so the process of science i believe is as important as the product and communicating the process of science is in my opinion even more important than communicating the product i would argue that what you have found may be of interest to a few people but the way in which you have found it may be of interest to a much larger group of people because methods can then go across disciplines so the process of science is extremely important and we don't do enough to convey especially to a wider audience especially to a general public which gives the impression that scientists are somehow magicians they pull things out of their hat and this of course creates an even bigger barrier between scientists and the general public and of course we should break that barrier there's nothing special about scientists we just do this because we enjoy it and we are lucky that somebody pays us to do our Uh, what we enjoy doing that's all that is special about us there's nothing else that is special so science is a completely should be a completely democratic process so in this talk also i will try and convey as much as possible the process rather than just the product so let me begin by giving you a description of generally how science happens in my research group i work with a large number of students and we all share one thing in common we love this wasp we love watching these wasps and it's great fun sitting and watching them we can watch them for hours together just for fun and in fact most of the time that's what we do and as you watch them for a long time you begin to see especially if the wasps are marked you begin to form some questions in your mind why did that wasp do this or how did that wasp manage to do that thing you these questions begin to arise in your mind completely naturally it's not artificial and you realize that for many of these questions it's probably not easy to find an answer but every now and then you come up with a question for which you think you might be able to find an answer 
And when we come up with such a question, we design a specific experiment or a specific study to try and answer that question. Sometimes it doesn't help, we fail, we don't make any progress, but sometimes we think we have an answer. Now, but the problem with that answer is that it immediately raises at least one more question. And you are not at all satisfied with that answer because if this is true, how can that be so? How can something else happen? So immediately there's another question. And then you begin to design a study to answer your second question, which gives you an answer, but then it raises a third question. So research progresses as a series of naturally occurring questions and tentative answers. But tentative answers raise new questions and the questions then lead to other tentative answers. That's how research progresses. And there is no reason why this talk should not be framed as a set of questions and answers. So I like to divide all that we have done over the decade into a series of questions and answers. And I will take a few questions and few tentative answers that I found to illustrate the process of science that happens in my research group. And that's how I will organize this talk. Now, very early in the game, I was struck by one fact. I showed you pictures of honeybees and ants. There, the queen is very much larger than the worker. She looks very different. In this species, that is not true. In fact, if you see on this slide, all wasps look the same. In fact, even by rigorous statistical analysis, you cannot identify the queen. The queen looks like everybody else. And yet, she is the queen. Everybody respects her. So I said, how is this possible? Why does this nondescript individual enjoy the status of queen? So there must be something unique about her behavior. So she doesn't look any different. So the first question I asked myself is, okay, so we are going to talk about conflict and cooperation, war and peace, and I will begin with some stories of peace. And then I will come back to the war. Idea. So the question I asked, first question I asked is, how does the queen behave as compared to her workers? Now, how do you answer this question? I simply began by making, what is behavior? What do the wasps do? So using a notebook and a pencil, I simply started writing down in plain English all the things that the wasps do. What do the wasps do? They sit, they walk, they feed the larvae, they fly, they bring food, they bite each other, they chase each other, they clean the nest, and so on. So I made a list. There will be a train going by from time to time. Okay. So I made a list of all these things and I asked, is the queen, what does the queen do and what do the workers do? And when I compared against my list to my surprise, I found that the queen and the workers all do everything. In fact, the queen, if the queen does 100 behaviors, the workers do 99 because the only thing they don't do is they don't lay eggs. So there is no real difference, even in behavior between the queen and the worker. So if you don't mind, can you keep your video on so that I get some feedback? Wonderful. Yeah, so <laughs> nice to see at least one face. I'm used to seeing 500 faces in your auditorium, but I'd like to see at least one face so that I know that you know um, everybody has not gone home and I'm speaking. <laughs> Thank you. So I reasoned that there is no qualitative difference between queens and workers, everybody does it, but there may be a quantitative difference. And so I designed methods to measure behavior. And I measured behavior in two different ways. One is I calculated how do the wasps divide their time different between different behaviors. I call this their time activity budgets. How much time does the wasp devote in sitting how much in flying, how much in feeding the larvae, how much in fighting, how much in resting. So I made a budget for every wasp and to see if these budgets are different between different wasps, particularly if they are different between the queen and the workers. Now, there are some behaviors that are very rapidly happen. So you can't really measure them as time because they happen in a second. For those I've counted, how many times does the wasp do this every hour? How many times does wasp A bite wasp B every hour? So I calculate and we call these frequency per, of occurrence per hour. So there is proportion of time, one measure of behavior. Frequency per hour of performance is another measure of behavior. So I calculated by making observations for all the wasps in the colony, because they're all marked, these two measures of behavior. And I had a large data matrix now. 
So all the animals on the uh, on the row headings and all the behaviors on the uh, column heading and inside the cell I had these numbers. And this from this I hoped to understand how the queen is different from the workers. Now, as you can imagine, this is kind of data matrix is ideally suited for multivariate statistics. So I teamed up with my colleague Niranjan Joshi, who was an expert in doing multivariate statistical analysis, and we performed some principal components analysis followed by some cluster analysis to see if we can find some pattern in the variation of, of the behavior between different walls. And to our great delight, we found that in every colony, we could discern three distinct clusters, three distinct kinds of wasps. And in using the social insect nomenclature, I call these as behavioral tasks. They are not morphological tasks as you see in ants, but they are behavioral tasks. And we found that we call these three behavioral tasks as sitters, fighters, and foragers based on their most conspicuous behavior. It turns out that the most conspicuous behavior of sitters is that they are lazy, they don't do anything. They're just sitting on the colony. And we, so we call them sitters. Then there are others who are very aggressive, who are always fighting and biting and chasing and nibbling other individuals and kind of running around and we call them fighters. And yet others go out and bring food and spend a lot of time working outside the colony and we call them foragers. So we're these three kinds of us. Now one trick I used, a deliberate trick I used in this is when doing this analysis, I did not pay any attention to the queen separately. I said, if the queen looks like everybody else, who am I to give her any special attention? Most people say, I will work on the queen or I'll work on the, uh, on the worker. Here I decided I'm not going to do anything else. And the great advantage of that is now post facto, I could go and ask, where is the queen? Is she a sitter? Is she a fighter? Is she a forager? In other words, I didn't tell my computer who is the queen and the computer gave me this analysis. So the question is, where is the queen? Common sense told us that the queen must be a fighter because other such species which had been studied before had been shown to work on the basis of queen's aggression. So the queen in such species typically is a very aggressive individual and by her physical aggression, literally by physically harassing her workers, she controls them. She prevents them from becoming new queens and she makes sure they work. So the queen must be a fighter. Now, again, to our great surprise, and I would say to our great delight, whenever things don't meet theoretical expectation, you should be very happy because that means you're going to find something. The queen is not a fighter. In colony after colony, we found that the queens of this species are lazy sitters. So we have an answer. How is the queen different from the workers? The queen is a non-aggressive, non-interactive, meek and docile sitter. Now, the reason why I call this a tentative answer is this answer is very disturbing. It can't be. How can this be true? So you can't celebrate your answer because you, you are troubled. You are saying, if this is true, if the queen is such a meek and docile sitter, how does she become a queen in the first place? Why should the workers respect her? If the queen is a big dominant bully biting you and chasing you and threatening you, I can see why you accept her as your queen. But if there's a nondescript individual who just looks just like you, sitting quietly in a corner somewhere, why do you respect her? So you can see how these questions are so important that it doesn't let you celebrate. You have, you have to know, answer this question. So we wanted to know how can this such a queen become a queen in the first place? So we had to design a different study now to answer this question. And here we said, we have to do an experiment. We have observed everything. More observation is not going to obviously give an answer. So we have to do an experiment. Now in all these cases, experiment means you manipulate the wasps in some way, you change them in some way, and you then observe them. That is what an experiment does. So here we said, we have to do this by actually observing the wasp in the process of becoming a queen. When she's actually becoming a queen, you should observe, then you will know how she becomes a queen. Now we know that in this species, if the queen dies, a new worker, one of the workers will become the next queen. So we said, let us simulate death of the queen. So we basically take a forceps and remove the queen from the colony and wait for one of the workers to transform herself into a queen. And that is the process we wanted to witness and see why the workers now begin to respect this new individual. And so our experiment design was as follows. 
we brought these wasps in this case to the laboratory and marked all the individuals and we spent a whole day observing all the wasps of a normal colony with the queen. By observing here again, I mean calculate time activity budgets and frequency per hour of performance of every behavior for every individual. Get these two data matrices. So we got them by studying this colony for eight hours. Early next morning, with the forceps, we removed the queen. And that day, for the next eight hours, we repeated all of these measurements in the absence of the queen. So what do the workers do in the absence of the queen? Now, we took out the queen and we had just put her in a little glass bottle and given her a drop of honey. We didn't know what to do with her. At the end of the day, we looked at this and she seemed fine. So my student asked, what shall I do with this queen? I said, why don't we put her back? Let the colony be happy. You know, we might destroy this colony and let us see what will happen. So we returned the queen to the colony and to our great surprise, she just walked back to the colony and continued as if nothing had happened. She became, she continued to be the queen of the colony. So we said, this gives us an opportunity. So on the third day, we remade all the measurements with the queen returned. So we have day one with the queen, day two without the queen, and day three, queen returned. And we compared the quantitative behavior in these three days. And we came up with extremely surprising results. This species is a fairly peaceful species. Yes, there are some, there is some aggression, was occasionally bite each other, chase each other, peck each other. We call these behaviors as dominance subordinate interactions. So one animal is dominant, it's the one who bites or chases or pecks. The other is subordinate, it gets bitten, it gets chased, it gets pecked. So we call this dominant subordinate behavior. This happens at a very low frequency as it happens in many species. It's a fairly peaceful society. But the moment we remove the queen, all hell broke loose and the society became hyper-aggressive. Extremely high levels of dominance interactions. And what was more surprising, in fact, the level of dominance increased, in some cases was twofold, fourfold, tenfold, twentyfold, thirtyfold increased compared to the previous day. What was even more surprising is that all of this aggression was shown by one worker. Only one worker did all of this. So I'll show you what the data looks like. So on day one, nobody shows much aggression. This is the frequency per hour of dominance behavior plotted on the y-axis, very little if any. On day two, it shoots up. And by just one individual, this individual on day one was showing maybe about four acts per hour. Now it shows about 35 acts per hour. And most interestingly, if you return the queen, she goes back to being a worker with very little aggression. It's just one individual. And notice that we identified this individual on behavior on day one post facto, because on day one, we didn't know who she was. Now we went back to the computer and we said, what was this individual hyper aggressive individual doing yesterday? And we found she was doing very little. Now, it turns out that if you don't return the queen, this individual will nevertheless drop her aggression, but she will become the next queen. In fact, the day her aggression becomes nearly zero, she will lay her first egg and become the next meek, docile, sicker queen. So we call this individual the potential queen. In other words, the potential queen begins her career as a very aggressive individual and only later she becomes meek and docile. So why do the work accept her? Because she is indeed a very nasty individual when she becomes the queen. But this tentative answer is also not very satisfactory, because if this is true, if she's aggressive only for one week and she becomes, she stays the queen for many months, how does she inhibit other workers from reproduction? She's only aggressive for the first week of her life. So wide open, you have to go back to the blackboard and say, how can this be possible? And so we have to now design another experiment to answer this question. How does a meek and docile queen actually inhibit workers from reproducing throughout her career. So here we proposed a hypothesis. It turns out that in the more advanced societies, such as the ants and the honeybees and the termites, the colony consists of tens of thousands, sometimes even millions of individuals. And certainly the queen cannot go and bite everybody and harass everybody physically. 
what she does in those societies is she produces pheromones. These pheromones are chemicals that she releases from her body. And these chemicals, when they reach the workers, it actually sterilizes them. It castrates them in some way and they do not reproduce. So we said, who knows? Maybe our queen has also learned this trick. Maybe our queen, even though it's a primitive insect society, even though she does not look different from the workers, maybe she has a chemical which she produces and therefore she doesn't have to go around <coughs> being physically aggressive. So in order to test this hypothesis, we designed yet another experiment. And in this experiment, what we did, we brought a colony to the laboratory. We put it in a cage. We studied all the wasps on day one as before. But on day two, instead of removing the queen, we first removed all the wasps. We took a knife and we cut the nest into two equal halves. Having cut the nest into equal, two equal halves, we inserted a wire mesh screen between the two halves. This wire mesh screen was such that the wasp actually cannot go through. In fact, the purpose of the wire mesh was to prevent the wasp from going through, but to allow volatile chemicals to go through. After the wire mesh was inserted, we took the wasp and we randomly distributed them between the left side and the right side. So we pick up a wasp, toss a coin and say, left, you go, heads, you go left, tails, you go right. Next wasp, heads, you go left, tails, you go right. <clears throat> and finally, we always treat the queen like anybody else. We pick up the queen, she gets no special treatment. We toss the same coin, heads, you go left, tails, you go right. <coughs> At the end of this, we had two fragments of the colony on two sides of a wire mesh with the queen and half the workers on one side and the other half workers on the other side. Now we observe both halves. What were the workers doing in each side? And on day three, equivalent of returning the queen, we picked the queen from wherever she was and moved her to the opposite side, did not disturb the workers. So same three day experiment, but done in a very different way. Now we had very specific predictions from this, from this experiment. And our predictions, that's why the design was like this. We said, if the queen pheromone is a volatile substance, both fragments of the colony should behave as if they have a queen. Because the queen is sitting on the left side and her pheromone is going through the mesh to the other side. Everybody can smell her. She's only a few centimeters away. She should, be, no, she should make no difference. They should behave like a normal one. However, if the queen pheromone is a non-volatile substance, then the wasp on the queenless side no longer have access to that. And they should think they have lost their queen and they should behave like a queen that's colony, which means what? One worker should become hyper aggressive and try to become the next queen. So we had very distinct, mutually exclusive predictions for two different hypotheses in this experiment. And when we did this experiment, we were able to answer this question. It turns out that this particular experimental design, which looks a little complicated, looks a little tedious, is a very, very powerful design. We have used this experimental design for many experiments, and I'll have occasion to talk about it at least one for one more question. Now, we have therefore we have done this experiment many, many, many times, probably a hundred times. But when this slide was made, this experiment had already been done 24 times. And in all 24 cases, prediction two was upheld. Wasp on the queen last side behaved as if they didn't have a queen. And when we moved the queen to the opposite side, that hyper-aggressive worker went back to work. And on the other side, a new individual became hyper-aggressive. I'll show you what the data looks like. Day one, nobody shows aggression. Day two, one individual becomes hyper-aggressive on the queenless side. Return the queen to her side, she goes back to work. No aggression, almost. And a different individual who was showing no aggression here suddenly becomes hyper-aggressive. Okay, so our tentative answer is Ropalidia marginata. This, this species is called Ropalidia marginata. Ropalidia marginata queens appear to use non-volatile pheromones to inhibit worker reproduction, and therefore they can afford to be meek and docile sitters. So you can see that as you answer new questions, your confidence in answers to previous questions and the one before that, and the one before that becomes stronger and stronger. So there is a whole body of work that develops in this fashion. And if something happens in between, then you go back and question your previous answers to your previous questions. And that is how science progresses it, it, and should in fact progress. No, so that's the answer. But 
The next question is how do the workers perceive this non-volatile substance? If it is non-volatile, how do they get it? We actually spent a lot of time, many years actually working to find the answer to this question. In the interest of time, I will not go through the experiments. I will just give you the answer. But the answer is important because it becomes relevant to the next question. So in this particular case, I'll just give you the answer. We tested three hypotheses. We asked whether it is through physical interaction. The answer is no. Whether it is through a relayed physical interaction, the answer is no. The answer is that the queen actually produces non this non volatile substance and she rubs it on the nest surface by rubbing her abdomen all over the nest. And the workers then get it from the nest. So the queen deposits it on the nest and the workers get it. And we have been able to prove this because what we did was we removed the queen, we extracted the pheromone and we rubbed it on the nest and we could masquerade like a queen. And what did, what did we find? We find, found that the hyperaggressive worker stopped being aggressive, not only when the queen was returned, but even when we applied the chemical onto the nest surface. So the answer to this is simply that she rubs the nest. So I won't go through the experiment in detail, but it's important to remember this because this will become relevant to another question. Now, whenever I explain this, people are fascinated. They, in fact, the thing that is most fascinated is you say all the workers look alike, you remove the queen, only one worker becomes hyper-aggressive and within a week she becomes next queen. Who is this privileged worker? As humans, we are very interested in knowing who is the next one, who is the next leader, who is the next director, who is the next prime minister. We all, always want to know. So people always ask me, who is the next queen? Can you identify her beforehand? The answer actually is no. So initially, for a long time, I would tell people, no, it doesn't look like there's anything special. We've never really been able to be sure who it is. But once you remove the queen, we are very sure. So I sort of got away by giving these casual answers for a long time. But the question became more and more persistent. And then at some point, I decided that we must do an experiment, design a study to answer this question. Who is the potential queen? Can we identify her? So the question is, can we predict the identity of the potential queen in the presence of the queen? So I decided that we must do something serious about it. Now, when a professor decides to do something serious, it means that the next PhD student has to answer the question. So the next PhD student uh, who came to my lab, her problem was, you have to identify the potential queen before removing the queen, then you get a PhD. So she spent five years, did many experiments, published many papers. At the end, she threw up her hand and said, but I cannot identify the potential. So to give you just one sample of what she did, she studied behavior and she showed that the potential queen and the workers are all completely overlapped. There is nothing unique about it. In fact, she showed that there is no way we can predict it. The potential queen is not unique. She's not unique by any criteria. She's not unique by her size. She is not unique by her dominance behavior. She is not unique by any other behavior. She is not even unique by the residual amount of ovarian development. See, only the queen has fully developed ovary. The workers have a small level of ovarian development. Even within that variation, she is nothing special. So there's really nothing at all special about her. And the answer really is we cannot predict. The next student who came to the lab said, okay, we don't know who the potential queen is, but do the wasps know who their next queen is? At first, this sounded like a question that may not be amenable to scientific investigation. In fact, many people said, this is not a scientific question. How can you know the mind of a wasp? How can you ever be sure that the wasp knows something or don't know something? But the student was very persistent and couldn't stop talking about it. So we spent a lot of time discussing, discussing and wondering whether there is a way in which we can answer this question, whether we can bring this to the realm of scientific investigation. In fact, we came up with some experimental designs. One of them seemed pretty good. She did the experiment. Afterwards, we said there's a flaw. There's a flaw in our reasoning. These results can have alternate explanations, so we cannot take this one. But she didn't give up, and she continued. And finally, I believe that we came up with an experimental design, which indeed will answer, help us to answer this question. So the question is, is it possible? So let now frame this question more scientifically, more objectively. Is it possible that there is a hair designate? Even though we cannot identify her, do the other wasps know who this hair designate? 
Now I will illustrate to you the experimental design which this student finally used, which is very, very hard to do, but very easy to understand. So let me explain this using a simple animation. This is where we went back to the design where we take a colony, cut it in half, put a wire mesh and put wasps on either side. That's the design we used. And here, the philosophy of the experiment is very different. Here we said, let's not simply have a hypothesis and see whether it is supported. We said, let's do it differently. Let us assume that there is indeed a hair disease. Let us assume that all the wasps know who she is, we don't know, except us, everybody knows. Let's make this assumption. Let's do an experiment and let's predict how the wasp would behave if these assumptions were true. If indeed there was a hair designate, if they knew how would they behave, if they didn't know how would they behave, and let us see how they behave and see whether our assumptions are correct. So we said, let's take a nest, cut it in half, distribute the wasp randomly, and we can assume that by chance, the queen in some experiments is on the left side, this is the wire mesh, these are the remaining workers, and the so-called hair designate by chance alone is in the opposite side. This is a possibility. In such a possibility, what would we expect? We would expect that the hair designate would immediately become a potential queen because there is, they cannot uh, smell the queen and we know this is what would happen. So she'll become a potential queen, she'll become hyper aggressive. However, if she is indeed the hair designate for the whole colony, not just for her side, then she should also be acceptable as the next queen for the other walls on the other side. To test this, we interchange the queen and the potential queen. We interchange their positions. And we said, now this potential queen should not be challenged even by those workers because she is supposed to be the hair designate for the whole column. And put her back, she should not have any problem on any side. However, this fortunate situation can occur only in about half the experiments because by chance alone, in the other half of the experiment, the hair designate may be sitting next to the queen. And there's nothing she can do. She cannot become hyperaggressive. So what would we expect on the opposite side, amongst the remaining workers, the best one will become the potential queen. Let us call her potential queen number one. In this experiment, she's the first one to become potential queen. Now, she is the best individual only for her half. She is not the hair designate for the whole colony. And Therefore, we move her to the opposite side and now all hell should break loose. Now she's coming face to face with the true heretic signet who says, I am the heretic signet and there should be a conflict between these two individuals. In fact, this individual should no longer be aggressive and the heretic signet should become hyper aggressive. So now she has an opportunity to be without the queen. But that's not the end of the story. If this PQ2 is the true hair designate, then the acid test for her is that she should be acceptable to the opposite side. So now we move her to the opposite side and ask whether she's challenged on this side. And therefore, our predictions are that the first potential queen should be unacceptable to the opposite side in about half the experiments. Because by chance alone, she's not the hair designate. And a second one should emerge. But our second prediction is that the second one should always be acceptable to both sides. There should never be a third potential queen. There should never be three contenders to the throne if you cut the nest in half. Because the hair designate is either on the left or on the right, and there should never be a third individual. So these are our very clear cut predictions. Now, as you can imagine, these experiments are very, very hard to do, very tedious to do. More tedious for the wasps, I think, than for us. And But nevertheless, because my student was so invested in this question, she spent a very long time, probably a couple of years, and she managed to do this experiment eight times. In five, in three of the experiments, she found that the first individual to become hyper-aggressive was hyper-aggressive on both sides. She was not challenged. This corresponds situation where she might actually have been the true heritage signet just by chance sitting on the opposite side. But in the remaining five experiments, the first individual became hyper-aggressive had to immediately stop being aggressive. A second individual became hyper-aggressive and she was successful on both sides. She was not challenged on either side. This corresponds situation where the hair designate was actually with the queen in the beginning of the experiment. So both of these predictions have been, have been upheld 
and therefore we think there is indeed a hair testing book. But what is the source of our confidence that all the wasps know? That confidence comes not from the statistics, not from the <coughs> quantity data, but from the simple observation that so there is a hair designate, even though we cannot identify her. That comes from the observation that the potential queen to the hair designate was never challenged. She did not receive a single act of aggression from the potential queen one. So this hyper-aggressive individual was brought face to face with her, but they never fought. In fact, the potential queen one knew that it's not my turn yet. The real hair designate is here. So or on the other side. The hair designate was obviously known and acceptable to all the wasps, including the potential queen. And that is the source of our confidence. This was a particularly uh, pleasurable moment for us because every time people would ask us, do you know who the potential queen is? And our answer always was no. And now we said, we know that the wasps know. Indeed, I'm very proud to say that we published a paper with exactly this title. We know that the wasps know. And we call them triptych successors to the queen in Rocolidia marginata. So there is a hair designate. We cannot identify her, but the wasp knows who she is. Now the next student who came to this, this is, that's why this is a never ending process. You might say, oh, now you can rest on your laurel. The next student says, comes, see students like to question the findings of the previous student. The next student says, how do you know there is only one hair designate? Maybe there is a whole lot of them waiting in queue. So find out. And what did he do? Remove the queen, found out the hyperaggressive individual. You can do that within 30 minutes. Remove the hyperaggressive individual, see what happens. Do you get another hyperaggressive individual? And you did the experiment. So this is the question. And in fact, he found remarkably <coughs> that in the beginning, nobody was aggressive. Remove the queen, one and only one individual becomes hyperaggressive. Nobody challenges her. Remove her, of the remaining one and only one individual becomes hyperactive. Nobody challenges her. You remove her, one and only one individual. Remove her, one and only one individual. Remove her, always only one and one. So in fact, in this slide it's not very clear, but you can see in this inset that this is the, the red bars are the aggression that the potential queen shows. The blue bars, which are essentially zero, is what she receives. So nobody challenges her. So in fact, there is a long reproductive queue of at least five potential queens, but maybe even longer. Maybe everybody is standing in a line awaiting their turn to become the next queen. But this is a remarkable discipline because which means they don't jump the queue. They don't go out of turn. So there is a lot of peace. There is a lot of order. There is a lot of cooperation, which is remarkable, but somewhat disturbing because if this is true, where is the war? Where is the conflict? Is there no conflict at all? In fact, we have to work very hard to detect conflict. That is the beauty of this species. They have conflict, but they hide it. So we did some experiments to ask, can we find conflict? In fact, we were itching to find conflict. We wanted to see fights. One of the questions we asked in the hope of finding evidence of conflict is how does the queen maintain her status? And why does she lose it sometimes? Because we know that in nature, after some time, the queen is overthrown and a worker takes over. After some time, she's overthrown, another one takes over. Why does the queen lose her status? Can we hope to see some conflict at that time? And the experiment we designed to do this was the following. We said, we want to artificially make the queen to be overthrown. How do we do that? We know that the queen applies her pheromone on the nest. So prevent her from applying the pheromone, and then they will think she's an important queen, and they will throw her out. How do you prevent the queen from applying her pheromones? People suggested that we block the opening from which this chemical comes out. People said, put nail polish there or put something, some wax there. I don't like to mess with the wasps. I don't like to do any such thing. So we came up with a very simple idea. We went to nature. We studied a wasp, identified the queen, identified the worker, then brought all these individuals to the lab, put them in a cage, but no nest. If there is no nest, where will she rub her pheromone? Where will she apply her pheromone? How will she tell the workers that she is the queen? And therefore, we predicted that she should be overthrown. My another student did this experiment several times. Believe it or not, the queen was not overthrown. Why? So the queen and all the workers were transferred to the cage, deprived of the nest, but the queen was not overthrown. Why? So we have to observe. When we observed in detail, we found 
that the queen continued to rub her abdomen. There was no nest, but all over the walls of the cage. Okay. But then we said, if she's applying the same quantity of chemical on this large surface area, as opposed to a small surface area, the concentration should be less. And there should be some evidence of this less concentration. In fact, there was evidence because the workers actually attacked her. They challenged her. But why was she not overthrown? She fought back. So she is a meek and docile sitter. But when push comes to shove, she can fight back. So in fact, and the queen retaliated, she almost never does. In natural colony, we rarely see workers attacking queen, even less often queens attacking workers. But we were able to create a situation, artificial situation, where this is possible, showing that there is hidden conflict. And what is remarkable is how the wasps are able to suppress this conflict. We asked a second, and so there is potential conflict. We did a second experiment to uncover conflict. We said we should see even greater conflict when we bring wasps from two colonies close to next to each other, because that is the greatest conflict. So the experiment we did was the following. What about conflict with outsiders? How do they treat wasps from other colonies of the same species? So the experiment was when members of one colony were introduced into, so we had two cages, two colonies. From, we took all the wasps from one cage and put it in the other cage without their nest. So we had resident wasps and we have alien wasps. What is the interaction? When young alien workers were freely admitted into a colony, no problem, just come and join. But older workers were allowed to live in the colony, but only away from the nest. Don't come anywhere near my nest. If you live in that corner, I have no problem. And what did the resident wasps do with the queen, alien queen? They located her wherever she was and tore her to pieces. The alien queen was attacked and killed. So you can see that the resident showed a very nuanced and differential treatment to the world. It was not a blanket, I'll kill all of you. It was very nuanced. So some young ones are accepted. We said, what is the fate of these young ones which are accepted? And we, another student found that when young alien workers are accepted into foreign colonies, they become completely integrated into their foster colonies. They become normal workers. They can even become future queens. In fact, yet another student showed that the probability that a foreign worker will become a queen in a resident colony is directly proportional to the number of foreigners. So she has no disadvantage. She forgets this a foreigner, they forget that she is a foreign. And now I come back and say, can we really understand an infant society? And I will leave, of course, the answer to you, but I want to come back and spend a minute in saying, but why should we even care about this? The wasps have, as we have seen, the wasps have great propensity to make war with outsiders and equally great propensity to maintain peace with insiders. That is the duality. Inside there's total cooperation with outside because even there is conflict, it is hidden. We have to uncover it artificially. From an evolutionary point of view, war with outsiders is easier to explain than peace with insiders because war with outsiders is not of much use unless we can combine it peace inside. If you're having war with outsiders as well as inside, what's the use of it? So that, and it is this dual strategy, this ability to try to find balance between conflict and cooperation that accounts for the success of the insect society. Insect societies are extremely successful in the environment. And in fact, we call them super organisms. And I believe that this is the reason why they become super organisms. So if you reflect on this, you can't help saying, but we humans are the same, aren't we? We do the same kind of things. In fact, I'm very fond, I'll quote you know, a third philosopher. I'm very fond of the statement by Voltaire who said, it is lamentable that to be a good patriot, one must become the enemy of the rest of mankind. So I come back, why do I study was for the same reason that an anthropologist studies humans? However, I do not think that we should imitate insect society or we should imitate nature at all. But I do think that they can hold a mirror to us and offer us a means to reflect on our own success and shortcomings about ourselves, help us to understand. Why do we even study tribal society? Not because we want to imitate them, but they help us to understand ourselves. And I think the wasps also help us to understand. They hold a mirror. I want to end by just making a very different point. As you may have noticed, all this research required very little. No sophisticated laboratory, no instruments, hardly any money, just passionate students and experiments. 
So my greatest debt is to the large number of students who, with whom I have had the great pleasure and privilege of working, all of them just as passionate. Now, I want to end by actually saying that, especially in India, biology is very fond of showing off their sophisticated instruments. In fact, when I'm taken as a visitor to some department, they say, we want to see our sophisticated instrument facility. And I say, yes, and a student takes me in a room full of all kinds of fancy equipment. The poor student, of course, doesn't know all about all these instruments, but they want to show off their sophistication. So when people come, visitors come to my lab, they ask me, can we see your sophisticated instrument facility? And I said, sure, these are my sophisticated instruments. The heads of my students are my sophisticated instrument with which I work. And I get great pleasure in talking to them, discussing with them, debating with them at work, much more than I would get by having a fancy instrument which beeps and gives me, out, uh, gives me outputs. So again, this is part of the process of science. I'm glad to have had the opportunity to convey some of this uh, to you and some of this excitement to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk and I love this concept of the student hive at the end, the uh, <laughs> wonderful. So um, um, I'm going to uh, um, ask everybody uh, uh, for uh, a discussion. Uh, if you have questions, please, uh, people who are on Zoom, uh, please uh, go to the participants window. And there it is, is a chance to uh, click on a hand raise button and you can raise your hands and I'll ask you to ask your questions. People who are on YouTube, there are 75 people on YouTube right now. And uh, uh, I've already asked them to put some questions there. And I am uh, um, asking uh, uh, one of the moderators to please uh, pick some questions from there and ask it for them, mentioning their names. Um, but since I have a, a, a finger on the button, I'm going to ask the first question. Sure, sure. <laughs> so let me go ahead. And, and very, very interesting, because uh, of course, you, you tend to uh, anthropomorphize things quite a bit. And uh, we, uh, certainly, I do. Um, but. Uh, you talked about conflict between um, uh, uh, within the members of a colony, and then you talked about bringing in another um, colony and, and putting them inside, and then the alien queen was vanquished. And yes. uh, um, but then you know what happens? You know, I, I'm thinking of a conflict between two societies, and uh, if you put them in a neutral zone, take two uh, wasp colonies and put them in a neutral zone, then how do the queens behave? Who dominates? I, I guess it would depend on how much space there is, because I know that they can go to two corners and have their own colony. Even in nature, these colonies are very close to each other and they recognize each other. And therefore they can manage to avoid conflict. But when we created a situation, see, we wanted to see conflict. So we created a situation where there was no option but conflict. So what the sense I get is that they try their best to avoid conflict. They can live in two corners and in fact, in nature, as I said, they can be very, very close to each other. So that is what fascinates me, that there is potential for conflict, but it is managed. It is the management of conflict, which I think that, you know, is most fascinating to me. That's absolutely fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to thanks. I'm going to um, uh, ask, uh, uh, say, first on the list is Chaitanya. Uh, Chaitanya and other sheets, I'm unmuting you. Yes. Can you please ask your question, Chaitanya? Yeah. Thank you, Professor Garakka, for a, such a wonderful lecture. My question is, once you remove the queen and a potential queen becomes uh, a new queen, say within a week, mm. and then you reintroduce the old queen, what will happen? Will they fight? I love these questions because then they allow me to cheat and show you experiments which I didn't have time to show <laughs> during the talk. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yes, we have done this experiment. In fact, I'll, I'll give you a slightly longish answer. Many people ask us this question. What will happen if you put the potential queen, if you put the queen back after some time? And I always said, I don't think I want to do that experiment because what will it tell me? After some time, she will not be accepted back. So I can find, okay, after X number of days, she will not be accepted because we know within 24 hours, she's accepted. Maybe 48 hours, she's accepted. Maybe 72 hours, she's not accepted. What will that tell me? It's not going to tell me anything. So for a long time, I refused to do this experiment. But then I found a really strong reason to do the experiment. And then we did the experiment. And the problem with this experiment is that if you take out a queen and keep her for a long time outside, she is deteriorating. So it's not a fair game. You put her in a bottle for three days and then say, go back and be the queen. That's not fair. That's another reason why I didn't want to do this. Experiment. So then we found a way to do this experiment without this problem. And that's where our mesh experiment came in handy. So now we have two halves. 
We have the queen on one side. She's perfectly happy. She has her own subjects and she is happy. On the other side, you have the potential queen. Now we can move the queen from left to right. When you move the queen, she is, of course, accepted. If she's accepted, we say this experiment has failed. We put her back. Go back. We'll try you tomorrow. So we bring her the next day. She's accepted. Put her back. We keep doing this till the potential queen on this side says, who are you? I am the queen here. So that is our end point. And why was that interesting? Because that tells us that this is where the pheromone of the old queen and the new queen are identical. So this is a behavioral titration of the pheromones. The new queen is developing her pheromones. The old queen is having constant level of pheromones. And where these lines intersect, that is the end point. Where, so in fact, by doing the experiment, we have shown that there are three chronological phases. In the first time phase, the old queen wins. The queen, old, new queen just quietly goes back, accepts, yes, yes, you are the queen. In the third phase, the old queen says, I am not good enough. You are really the new queen. She gives up voluntarily. In the intermediate zone, they fight. And they can fight unto death. The same individuals. One day, the old queen and the new queen both agree that the old queen is the real queen. Two days later, they fight unto death because both think that they are the legitimate queen. Two days later, both the old and the new voluntarily agree that the new queen is the legitimate queen. Over a span of one week, they can go through these life and death transitions just in order to avoid conflict, but also not be, avoid, not be cheated by somebody else. Thank you, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, sorry, Shomak, you're muted, but I assume you're letting me. Go ahead. Uh, so I have uh, two questions. Is that okay? okay. Yeah. So one is, uh, I don't know whether this is a valid scientific question, but since you mentioned that uh, you think of, that, that biologists think of these insect colonies as super organisms, mm -hmm. is there some scientific evidence for a collective consciousness, this so-called hive mind? Or is this just something that is invented? No, it's an it's extremely active area of research with huge spin-offs, which have already, as I said, yielded millions of dollars. Uh, not only in the context of algorithms for communication, but in many other ways. So this superorganism concept is a real concept. It can be shown experimentally. And in fact, there is what we call swarm intelligence. And this swarm, in, so, the, so we use different metaphors. One is called distributed intelligence because intelligence is not in one individual. And we can show experimentally that each individual is rather stupid. But when lots of individuals do the same stupid thing together, something completely different emerges. And this is what we call an emergent property. So this, this is very real. It has been studied. It, it has been actually even put to practical use. But what is the role of the queen in all of this? Because the queen is, is, is the opposite end of the hive consciousness. She's just one individual. Interesting point. That is where sometimes I agree with people that you shouldn't use the word queen. The queen is not a leader. The beauty of these insect societies is they have no top-down control. It's completely bottom-up. It is all self-organized. The queen is superior to the others only in her reproduction. But in terms of managing the colony affair, it's a completely bottom-up, decentralized, self-organized regulation. Mm -hmm. That's the speciality of insect societies. And that is why I think there's a great deal for us to learn from. So I have a somewhat more mundane question. So uh, since you mentioned that uh, you use colored markers to mark individuals, uh, these are, of course, chemicals of their own. And since pheromones are so important for these hives, yes. uh, how do you take care? Or is this a problem that you have to worry about? Okay. First step is that I did a lot of research and I found a paint a company that makes paints which are non-toxic, non-smelling, extremely safe. It is made for children to play with in the United States. So, you know, that's, in fact, I am very proud to say that's the only item of our research we, we import. Everything else is, is indigenous. We import this paint from the United States. Second thing is, of course, we tested, we compared marked and unmarked, and we find don't at least we can't detect any difference. Right. And the paint is dries very quickly, does not smell, stays for the entire life of, of the organism. Thank you.
Great, thank you. Uh, before going on to the next question in Zoom, I'm just asking whether, uh, can somebody pick, uh, can Dipankar pick a question from YouTube? There's a very yes, large number uh, of questions. I think uh, a number of questions that were uh, asked on YouTube have been already answered, uh, okay. both through the discussion and some partly in the talk itself. Uh, there's one question, and this is from uh, Akirino Rajadri. Is, is the next in line equally likely to be a fitter, fighter, or a forager? Good question again. So we did a lot of experiments to answer this question. And uh, as you can see, these are very difficult experiments because in each experiment, you have only one queen. What the summary of this experiment is that the next queen is equally likely to come from the sitter group or from the fighter group, very rarely from the forager group. And the reason why we think this is true is the foragers will be too old. Okay. Great, thanks. Uh, uh, can uh, can I uh, go to Sh Shonjit next? Shonjit Mitra, I'm unmuting here. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, hi, very nice talk. I, I have a question very similar to Akirino's question that mm -hmm. for the uh, when a potential queen is becoming a queen, mm -hmm. Uh, she's showing some kind of uh, dominance and so on. But mm -hmm. how, what are the qualities this society is looking at to decide the potential queens? When they're creating this queue, what maybe like they're looking for? Yeah, so this comes back to the question of why we are not able to predict, right? If we knew the answer to your question, we should be able to predict. The fact that we cannot predict who the next one is means in short answer is we don't know. But let me give you a slightly longer answer. So, of course, we've tried very hard to, we continue to ask this question. Now, one of the problems in asking this question has been because if you're, if you're doing statistics, you need a reasonable large sample size. And with one colony, you do a whole experiment, you get only one data point. And that has been one of the problems. But when my student decided that he is going to ask whether everybody is standing in the queue, that gave us a data sample size of 100 potential queens which we had never imagined that we will ever get. So with 100 potential queens, we said, now we should be able to do some modeling, some statistical modeling, see whether we can narrow down at least to some extent, what are the special features of these 100 individuals compared to the others. Now there was a further technical problem because these were 100 individuals who became potential queens. The rest didn't become, and we couldn't compare these two. But the nice thing is that of the 100, we knew their position in the queue. Number one, two, three, four, five, and so on. So we asked what predicts the position of an individual in the queue. So our universe was these 100, and now what we wanted to find out was which position and what determines. So we put in everything we can think of in the model, and nothing was statistically significant except age. Now, age was a significant predictor of your position in the queue. So we said, is it simply an age-based system? The queen dies, the oldest individual becomes next queen. She dies, and the next oldest individual is as simple as that. Answer is unfortunately or fortunately no. Because we asked if this is a simple age-based system, is it is it respected? So the experiment we did was as follows. We studied a number of colonies. We determined the ages of all the individuals. And this is not easy. The only way to determine the age is to wait until all the old individuals die and only the individuals born after we have started observing are alive. So we expect or take about two months, keep observing till all the old ones have died and you have a cohort of individuals whose exact date of birth you know. Now once you have that, for each colony, we made a succession. This is the queen. This should be PQ1 because she is the next oldest individual. This should be PQ2, 3, 4, 5. We made our prediction. Then we did the experiment. We removed the queen and asked, who became the next queen? And if our prediction was upheld, fine. If it was not, we said somebody jumped the queue. So we call this a queue jumping analysis. And we ask how often do individuals jump the queue and become queens out of turn compared to their age? And the answer is very often. So age is a statistically <laughs> significant predictor, but not a perfect predictor of who will be the next queen. So this one way to summarize this is to say that the potential is queen, queen is drawn from amongst the older individuals. But within that, we don't know exactly who yet. Now, one possibility is that within that it's just stochastic. The other possibility is there are deeper 
behavioral things which we have not yet discovered. I can just uh, reveal to you confidentially that a student of mine has just probably found a way to predict the potential queen by doing what is called multi-layered uh, network analysis. But the paper is with the referees until the referees give their thumbs up. I'm not going to make a claim and I think that's a very good practice. So I will not make the claim, but it is possible that we will be able to tell you that we can identify. But it is, as I said, by this process called multi-layer network analysis, it may be possible to predict to the point. We don't know yet. That's absolutely fascinating. Before going to Connor, can we uh, see whether there are any more questions on, on YouTube? It's still a quite a large number of people there writing. Uh, 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 one question maybe uh, uh, that's uh, worth asking right now is, uh, is there any difference observed between the chemicals mm -hmm. that uh, if you introduce an alien queen uh, and the uh, uh, other uh, queen which was there, uh, are there any difference in the chemicals that are... Uh, yeah, that's obviously a very important question. Do queens of different colonies have different chemicals? Yeah. The answer is no. Uh, the way we did this experiment was we see our, ex how did we first prove? We said, we take out the queen, we find that one worker becomes hyper aggressive, return the queen, she'll stop being aggressive. Instead of returning the queen, we extract the chemicals from the queen which we have removed, we put that chemical and the hyper aggressive individual stopped doing it. This is our, already we have done this. Now we said, what if I remove a queen? allow a worker to become hyper-aggressive and then introduce chemicals from another queen from another colony, not from this colony. Will she still recognize this, respect this and stop being aggressive? Answer is yes. So it is the same chemical. Then how do they know that this is a foreign queen? We think the most likely hypothesis is there are different signals. One is to signal I am a queen. The other is to signal that I belong to this colony. So there are colony recognition signals and fertility signals and the wasp use both of these and in fact they use the both of these i think in the following interesting way if you are a fertile individual belonging to my colony you are the most valuable individual if you are a non-fertile individual foreign colony you are not such a big threat but if you are fertile and foreign you are the real big threat and that is how i think they're able to show that nuanced behavior in that experiment because young individuals don't yet have a pheromone so I think it's a combination of these two that the was used to be able to uh, recognize foreign trees, not just by the fertility signal. Great, thank you. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, uh, next uh, on Zoom, I think it's Kanak, no? Kanak Sa. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, hi, uh, very nice. So hi. Uh, I think my question is probably answered in various ways. Uh, so I, I have a slightly different variant of the question. So suppose okay. in a uh, colony, you uh, somehow remove the queen. Mm -hmm. the, the, how does the like, you know, colony evolve? Will they make a new queen from the working class? Immediately. 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 And that's immediately. Yes, immediately. In fact, not only that, you remove that and then make the next one. So they're all in a line. And uh, so you can really never keep a colony queenless for very long. Within 30 oh. minutes, there's a new queen. Within 30 minutes? Yes. <laughs> oh. it is very early, but she lays her first egg one week later because she has to develop okay. so in fact we have studied these individuals as a time course so from day zero when the old queen is still present to the day when the new queen actually lays her first egg and during that period she will drop her aggression from very high to very low she will develop her ovaries from very low to very high <coughs> and her pheromone which is a complex thing, which is actually some 30 different compounds. So she has a cocktail of pheromones and the cocktail composition in three dimensional space, we can show that it moves from a position which is indistinguished from a worker to one which is indistinguished from the queen. So all this happens in the course of the week. <coughs> okay, and just, uh, just one, one more. So in this case, once if, if you remove a like, you know, sort of special queen and then it makes a new queen, you yeah. said in 13 minutes and and then that that colony is this gets stabilized in some way yes in fact it's, what is most interesting is we find no disruption 
Okay. Removal of queen causes almost no disruption because within a few minutes they have a new queen. So in terms of their bringing food, in terms of their protecting themselves, there is no disruption by removing the queen. So they, they have managed to have a system by which you know you don't have one, you have another one. Okay. And how do you measure this? Is there a quantification for this? Yes, we measure, for example, rates at which they bring food, rates at which they feed the young ones. So we measure all, so the, all the normal colony activities. We don't find any disruption. I mean, there may be disruption for one day because the individual is very hyperregulated. But after that, there is no disruption. Even during that day, they will still bring food and feed the larvae. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you so much. I mean, I've, we've kept you for uh, very long. I'm asking no whether uh, in, uh, were people monitoring YouTube, is there any other uh, substantial question? People are free to send me questions by email if they have not got a chance to ask me now. People are feel, should feel free to send me their questions by email. Great. Are there any others uh, uh, that are, that are uh, uh, hanging out there in, in YouTube world? Nothing. And I um, hear also there are, I don't see any other questions going, going, gone. Then thank you so much. This was a most amazing experience. Thank and you. I'm sure uh, people on, on both the, the channels um, really enjoyed it. And this will, of course, be put up on, on YouTube uh, for people to watch. Uh, and I'm sure hundreds of people watch this later on. Uh, thank you so much again. And uh, for people who uh, came and attended, I can see a lot of the academic community here. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Pandey, uh, uh, Director of IUACR GV member, who was also here. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and thank you, uh, everybody else. Yeah, uh, my... You can uh, digitally uh, applaud <laughs> if you can. We have a uh, Zoom, Zoom applaud. That's another thing you missed, don't you? you? In the middle, you know, you don't have people applauding. I you emailed applaud. on the first slide. So when this is put up on uh, YouTube, you will find my email on the first slide. Great, wonderful. Thanks. Somebody asked for my email, it's on my first slide. But also you can Google me and find my email. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, Happy New Year uh, to Happy everybody year. who attended. Yes. Thank, Thank you very much. We are formally ending this talk now. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.